Hello, and welcome back to the Quarantine Theater Company. Uh, I've got a fun read tonight. Um, we're all going back to basics, doing some old Shakespeare. Uh, tonight we are doing Much Do About Nothing. Um, so we're, we're just going to cut right to the chase here. Uh, everybody that's joining us, we've got Travis as Leonardo. Not Leonardo Travis, he's not a turtle, just so you know. Um, we've got Lynn joining us. She's going to be our hero this evening. Um, I will be portraying Beatrice. Um, I'm Anne again. Um, Mary Pat is joining us. She's going to be our Don Pedro slash Prince and many other characters. We've got everybody kind of doing double duty. Jared's going to be our Claudio tonight. We've got Logan as Mr. Wadadick, Benedict, Wadadick, something like that. Um, then we've got Jennifer join us as a dungeon. Um, Bridget's going to be our about the star and our dogberry. And then we've got a newcomer, a quarantine theater company virgin, Kate. Welcome, Kate, everyone. Hey, hey. She's going to be Margaret Embraccio. So without further ado, let's get down to business. This is much ado about nothing. Travis, that's you. Yes, I thought I learned to read. Okay. Damn well, it! I, I learn in this little letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night into Messina. He's very near by this. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen have you lost in this action? But few of any sort, and none of name. A victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I find here that... Don Pedro hath bestowed much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part, and equally remembered by Don Pedro. He hath borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb that the feats of a lion. He hath indeed better bettered expectation than you must expect of me to tell you how. He hath an uncle here in Messina, will be very much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy in him, even so much that joy could not show itself modest enough without a badge of bitterness. Did he break out into tears? In great measure. A kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so washed. How much better is it to weep at joy than to joy at weeping? Ugh, I pray you. Is Sir Montal? Wow, Mount Tanto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that name, lady. There was none such in the army of any sort. What, what, what is he that you ask for, niece? My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. He sets up his bills here in Messina and challenged Cupid at the flight. And my uncle's fool, reading, reading the challenge, subscribed for Cupid and challenged him at the Burt Bolt. I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed? For I indeed promise to meet all of his killing. Faith, niece. You tax Signor Benedict too much, but he'll be met, he'll, but he'll be meet with you. I doubt it not. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual. He hath, hath uh, I cannot talk tonight. He hath helped to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier too, lady. And a good soldier too, lady. Well, what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord. A man to a man. Stuffed with all honorable virtues. Oh, it is so indeed. He is no less a stuffed man, but for the stuffing. Well, we are all mortal. You must not, sir. Mistake my niece. There is a kind of merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. They never met, meet, but there's a skirmish of wit between them. 
Alas, he gets nothing by that. And our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off. And now is the whole man governed with one. So that if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse. For all it is wealth that he hath left to be known a reasonable creature. Who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. Is it possible? Well, very easily possible. He wears his fate as, as fashion of his cat. He wears his fate, but as the fashion of his cat. It ever changes with the next block. I see, lady. The gentleman is not in your books. No, no. And, and he were, I would burn my study. But I pray you, who is his companion? Is there no young square now that will t- make voyage with him to the devil? He is most in the company of the right noble Claudio. Oh, Lord, he will hang upon him like a disease. He's sooner caught than the pestilence. Take the taker runs presently mad. God help the noble Claudio. If he had caught the Benedict, it will cost him a thousand pounds ere he be cured. I will hold friends with you, lady. (laughs) Do good friends. You will never run mad, niece. These dogs of Messina. No, not till a hot January. Don Pedro is approached. Good Signor Linato, are you not come to meet your trouble? The fashion of the world is avoid the costing you encounter it. Never trouble my house in the likeness of your grace, for trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow and happiness takes You embrace your charge too willingly. Ah, I think this is your daughter? Her mother hath many times told me so. Were you in doubt so that you asked her? Senor Benedict, no, for then where you are, were you a child? You have it full, Benedict. We may guess by this what you are, being a man. Truly, the lady fathers herself. Be happy, lady, for you are like an honorable father. Well, if Signor Leonato be her father, then she would have his head on his shoulders for Almasina, as like him as she is. I wonder what you will be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What, my dear lady disdain? Are you yet living? Yeah. It is possible that Christine should die while she hath such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict. Courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat? But as certainly as I am loved of old ladies, only you accepted. And what I could afford in my heart, I had not a hard heart, but for truly I love none. Oh. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled by a pernicious suitor. I thank God and my cold blood. I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that mind so some gentleman or other shall escape a, a predestinate scratched faced. Scratching could not make it worse, and twere such a face as yours were. Oh, you are a rare parrot teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse have the speed of your tongue and so good a continuer, but keep your way, I God's name I have done. Uh, you always end with a jade's trick. I know of you old. That is the sum of all, Donato. Signor Claudio and Signor Benedict. My dear friend Lenato hath invited you all. I tell him we shall stay here at least a month. He heartily prays some occasion may detain us longer. I dare sway he is no hypocrite, but prays from his heart. If you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. Let me bid you welcome. My lord being uh, reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please it your grace lead on. Your hands, Lenato. We will go together. Benedict, 
Didst thou know the daughter of Signor Leonato? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Do you question me as an honest man, should you, or for my simple true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Why, I faith, uh, methinks she's too low for a high praise, and too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise. Only this commendation I can afford her, um, that were she other than she is, she were unhandsome, and being no other but as she is, I do not like her. <laughs> thou thinkest I'm in sport, I pray thee, tell me truly how, you th- how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you acquire after her? Oh, can the world buy such a jewel? Yeah, but case to put it in. But speak you this with a sad brow. Or do you play the flouting jack to tell us Cupid is a good hair finder and a Vulcan a rare carpenter? Come, in what key shall man take you to, to go into song? When mine eye, she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. <laughs> I can see yet without spectacles, yet I see no much no such matter. There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury exceeded her in the beauty of the first of May, not the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? Oh, I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn the contrary, if Hero would be my wife. Is come to this, in faith hath not the world one man that he will wear his cap with suspicion. Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to, I faith, how thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into yoke, where the print of it and sigh away Sundays. Oh, look, Don Pedro is turned to seek you. What hath, what secret hath held you here that you followed not to Lenatos? I would, your grace, would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear, Count Claudio, uh, I can be secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so, but my allegiance, mark you this on my allegiance. He is in love. With who? Well, now that is your grace's part. Mark how short his answer is. With Hero, Leonato's short daughter. If it were so, so were it uttered. Like the old tale, my lord. If it is not so, nor twas not so, but indeed, God forbid, should it be so. If my passion change not shortly, God forbid it should be otherwise. Amen. If you love her, for the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. By my two faiths and troths, my lord, I spoke mine. That I love her, I feel. That is she worth, that she is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved, nor know how she should be worthy, is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. Thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty. And never could maintain his part, but in the force of his will. That a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her the most humble thanks. But that I will have a recheat winded in my forehead or hang my bugle on an invisible baldrack, all women shall pardon me. Because I will not do to them the wrong to mistrust any. I will do myself the right to trust none. And, well, the fine is, for the which uh, I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love. (laughs) With anger, with sickness, or with hunger, my lord, not with love. Prove that I ever lose more blood with love than I ever get again with drinking. Pick out mine eyes with a ballad maker's pen and hang me up on the door of a brothel house in the sign of blind Cupid. Well, if ever dost fall from this faith, thou wilt prove a notable argument. <laughs> if I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me. And if well, that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder and call me Adam. Well, as time shall try, in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke. Yeah, the savage bull may. But if ever the sensible Benedict hear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them on my forehead and let me be vilely painted in such great letters as they write, here is a good horse for hire. Let them signify under my sign, here you may see Benedict, the married man. <laughs> if this should ever happen, thou wouldst be horn mad. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. I look for an earthquake too then. Well, you will temporize with the hours. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, prepare to Linados. 
commend me to him and tell him I will not fail him at supper, for indeed he hath made great preparation. I have on, uh, almost matter enough in me for such an, uh, uh, an abasage, so I commit you. <laughs> to the tuition of God for my house, if I had it. The 6th of the July, your loving friend, Benedict. Nay, mock not, mock not. The body in your discourse is sometimes guarded with fragments, and the guards are but slightly baited in the matter. Ere you flout old ends any further, examine your consciousness. And so I leave you. <laughs> My liege, your highness now may do me good. My love is thine to teach. Teach it but how, and thou shalt see how apt it is to learn any hard lesson that may do thee good. Hath Leonato any son, my lord? No, child, but hero. She's his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord, when, when you went onward on this ended action, I looked upon her with a soldier's eye that liked, but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I'm returned, and that war thoughts have left their places vacant in their, in their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair young hero is, saying I liked her ere I went to wars. Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hair with a book of words. If thou dost love fair hero, cherish it. I will break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Twas not to this end that thou beginnest Beganest the twist, so fine a story. How sweetly you do minister to love, that no love's grief spies complexion. The less my liking might you sudden seem, I would have salved it with a longer treats, tr treatsy, treatise. What need the bridge much broader than the flood? The fairest grant is necessity. Look what will serve as fit, tis once thou lovest and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in disguise and tell fair hero I am Claudio, and in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart. I'll take her hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after to her father I will break, and the conclusion is she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. How now, brother? Where is my cousin, your son? Hath he provided this music? He is very busy about it, but brother, can I tell you strange news that you yet dreamt not of? Are they good? As the event stamps them, but they have a good cover, they show well outward. The prince and Count Claudio, walking in thick pleached alley in mine orchard, were thus much overheard by a man of mine. The prince discovered to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter and meant to acknowledge in this, it in this night in a dance, and if uh, he found her accordant, he meant to, take, uh, meant to take the present time by the top and instantly break with you of it. Hath the fellow any wit that told you this? A good sharp fellow, unlike yourself. But I will send for him and question him yourself. Wow, and um... No, 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 no. We, we will hold it as a dream till it appear itself, except for you. But I will acquaint my daughter with thou that she may be better prepared for an answer if pre-adventure this be true. Go you and tell her of it. Uh, cousins, you know not what you have to do. Oh, oh I, I cry you mercy, friend. Go with me and I will use your skill. Good cousin, have a care this busy time. the good year, my lord. Why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breeds. Therefore, the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? If not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, goest about a, to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. 
I must be sad when I have cause, and smile at no man's jests. Eat when I have stomach, and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy, and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry, and calm no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have a, of late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace, where it is impossible you should take true root, but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain-dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am, and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I make all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? What news, Boratio? Oh, I came yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonato. And I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve for any model to build mischief on? What is he for a fool that betroths himself to unquietness? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who, the most exquisite Claudio? Even he. A proper squire. And who? And who? Which way looks he? Mary, on Hero, the daughter and the heir of Leonardo. A very forward march, chick. How came you to this? Oh, being entertained for a perfumer as I was smoking a musty room, comes me the prince and Claudio, hand in hand, in sad conference. I whipped me behind the heiress, and there heard it agreed upon that the prince should woo Hero for himself. And having obtained her, give her to Count Claudio. Come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him any way, I bless myself in every way. You are both sure and will assist me? To the death, my lord. Let us to the great supper. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. Would the cook were on my mind, shall we go prove what's to be done? We'll wait upon your lordship. What is not Count John here at supper? I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looks. I never can see him, but I am a heartburn for an hour afterwards. He looks of a very melancholy disposition. He were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. One is too like an image and says nothing, and the other's too like my lady's eldest son, ever more tattling. Then half Signor Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth, and half Count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. <laughs> With a good leg and a good foot, uncle, <laughs> and money enough in his purse. Ah, such a man would win any woman in the world if he could get her good will. By my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. In faith, she's too cursed. Uh, too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God's sending that way. For to said, God sends a cursed cow short horns, but to a cow too cursed, he sends none. So by being too cursed, God will send you no horns just if he send me no husband for the which blessings i am at him upon my knees every morning and every evening lord i could not endure a husband with a beard on his face well I'd rather lie in, in woolen you may light on a husband that hath no beard what should i do with him dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman he hath a beard is more than a youth, and he hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Therefore, I will even, 
I will even take a sixpence in earnest of the beard head or bear herd and lead his apes into hell. Well then, go you into hell. No, but to the gates and, and there will be the devil to meet like an old cuckold with horns on his head and say, get you to heaven, Beatrice, get you to heaven. There's no place for you maids. So I deliver up my apes and away to St. Peter for the heavens. He shows me where the bachelors sit and there we live as merry as the day is long. Well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Eh, yes. Faith, it, it is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say, Father, as it please you. But yet, for all that cousin, let him be a handsome fellow. Or, or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. No, not so God make men of some other metal than earth. Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a piece of valiant dust? To make an account of her life, to, to a clod of a wayward moral? No, I'll, go, I'll take none. Adam's sons are my brethren and truly I hold it as a sin to match in my kindred. Daughter, remember what I told you. If the prince be deuce, uh, solicit you in that kind, you know your answer. The fault will be in the music, cousin, if you be not wooed in good time. If the prince be too important, tell him there is measure in everything, and so dance out the answer. For hear me, he wrote, wooing, wedding, and representing, or I'm sorry, and repenting is a scotch jig, a measure, a sink pace. The first suit is hot and hasty like a scotch jig, and Full is fantastical. The wedding, mannerly and modest, has measure full of state and ancientry. And then comes repentance, and with his bad legs falls into the same place faster and faster till he sink into his grave. Cousin, you apprehend passing shrewdly. Ugh, I have a good eye, Uncle. I could see a church by daylight. The revelers are entertaining, brother. Make good room. Lady, will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and, and say nothing. I am yours for the walk. And especially when I walk away. With me in your company? I may say so when I please. And when please you to say so. When I like your favor. For God defend the loot should be like the case. My visor is Philemon's roof. Within the house is Jove. Well, why then? Your visor should be thatched. <sighs> speak low if you speak, love. Well, I would, you did like me. So would not I for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Which is one? I say my prayers aloud. I love you the better. Ah, the heroes may cry, amen. God, match me with a good dancer. Amen. And God keep him out of my sight when he, when the dance is done. Answer, clerk. No more words. The clerk is answered. I know you well enough. You are Signor Antonio. But I am not. I know you by the waggling of your head. To tell you true, I fit him. You could never do him so ill well unless you were very man. Here's his dry hand up and down. You are he and you are he. A word I am. Come, come. Do you think I do not know you by your excellent wit? Can virtue hide itself? Go to, mum. You are he. Graces will appear and there and there's an end. Will you not tell me who 
told you so. No, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are? Not now. But I was disdainful in that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Well, this was Signor Benedict that said so. What's he? Oh, I'm sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Oh, why, he's the prince's jester, a very dull fool, only his gift. I'm sorry, only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but the libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy, for he both pleases men and angers them. And then, then they laugh at him and beat him. I'm sure he is in the fleet. I, I, I would he had boarded me. When I know the gentleman, I'll, I'll tell him what you say. Oh, do, do. He'll be but break a comparison or two on me, which I adventure not marked or not laughed, it strikes to him into melancholy. And then there's a partridge wing saved, or the fool will eat no supper that night. We must follow the leaders. In every good thing. Nay, if they lead to any ill, I will leave them at the next journey. Sure, my brother is amorous on hero, and hath withdrawn her father to break him about it. The ladies follow her, and but one visor remains. That is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. Are you not Signor Benedict? <laughs> you know me well. I am he. Signor, you are very near my brother in his love. He is enamored on Hera. I pray you dissuade him from her. She is no equal for his birth. You may do the part of an honest man in it. How know you he loves her? I heard him swear his affection. So did I too, and he swore he would marry her tonight. Come, let us to the banquet. Thus I answer in the name of Benedict. But hear these ill news in the ears of Claudio. Tis certain so. The prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all other things, save in office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent, for beauty is a witch against whose charms faith melted into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof, which I must trust it not. Farewell, therefore, hero. Count Claudio. <clears throat> yeah, same. Come, will you go with me? Uh, whither? Even to the next willow about your business, county. What fashion will you wear the garland of? Uh, about your neck like an usher, uh, uh, usher's chain? Or under your arm like a lieutenant's scarf? Uh, you must wear it one way, for the prince hath got your hero. I wish him joy of her. <laughs> Why, that's spoken like an honest rover, so they sell bollocks. Uh, what did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you, leave me. Oh, now you strike like the blind man. Twas the boy stole your meat and you'll beat the post. If it'll not be, I'll leave you. Alas, poor hurt foul. Now will he creep into the sages. But that my lady Beatrice should know me and not know me. The prince's fool. <laughs> it may be I go under that title because I am Mary. Yeah, but I am so apt to do myself wrong. I am not so reputed. It is the base, though bitter disposition of Beatrice that puts the world in her people and so gives me out. Well, I'll be revenged as I may. Now, Signor, where's the Count? Did you see him? Troth, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Fame. I found him here as melancholy as a large in a warren. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the goodwill of his young lady, and I offered him my company to a willow tree, either to make him a garland as being forsaken, or bind him up a rod as being worthy of to be whipped. To be whipped? What's his fault? The flat transgression of a schoolboy who, being overjoyed with finding a bird's nest, shows it to his companion and he steals it. Wilt thou mayst trust the transgression? The transgression is in the stealer. 
yet it had been not been uh, amiss. The rod had been made, and the garland too. Uh, for the garland he might have worn himself, and the rod he might have bestowed on you, who, as I take it, hath stolen the bird's nest. I will but teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. Ah, if their singing answer is your saying, by my faith you say honestly. The Lady Beatrice have a quarrel with you. The gentleman that danced with her told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she misused me past the endurances of a block. An oak, but with one green leaf on me, would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great thaw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her termination, there'd be no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit, yea, and have cleft his club to make a fire too. <laughs> Come, talk not of her. You shall find her the eternal eight in good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her, for certainly, while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary, and people sin upon purpose because they would go thither. So, indeed, all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follows her. Look, here she comes. Will your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go on the slightest errand now to the antipodes that you will devise to send me on. I will fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia. Bring you a length of Presper John's foot. Fetch you a hair of the great Cham's beard. Do you uh, any ambassage to the Pygmies rather than hold three words? Commence with this harpy. You have no employment for me. None but to desire your good company. Oh, God, sir, there's a dish I love not. I cannot endure my lady tongue. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. A double heart for a single one. Mary, once before he won it of me with false dice. Therefore, your grace, we will say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why, how now, Count? Wherefore are you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then? Sick? Neither, my lord. Oh, the Count is neither sad, nor sick, nor merry. Nor well, nor... But civil count, civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. I faith, lady, I think your blazon to be true, though I'll be sworn if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is one. I have broke with her father, and his goodwill obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God thee give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say, Amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Ah. Ah. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but a little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as you're mine, I am yours. I give away myself for you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let not him speak neither. In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Yea, my lord, I think it, poor fool, it keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in her heart. Oh, and so she doth, cousin. Oh, good Lord for alliance. Thus goes everyone to the world but I, and, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry, hi-ho, for a husband. 
Lady Beatrice, I will get one for you. Oh, I would rather have one of your fathers getting half your grace, near a brother like you. Your father got an excellent husband, if a maid could come by them. How will you have me, lady? Oh, no, my lord, unless I might have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence most offends me, and to be merry best becomes you, for out of question you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord, my mother cried, but then there was a star danced, and under that I was born. Cousins, God give you joy. Grace, will you look to those things I told you of? I cry you mercy, uncle, by your grace's pardon. By my troth, a pleasant spirited lady. There's little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad, but when she sleeps, and not ever sad, then, for I have heard my daughter say she hath often dreamt of unhappiness and wakened herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear the tell of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all her wooers out of suit. Oh, we didn't highlight that one. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, Lord, my Lord. If they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. County Claudio, when mean you go to church? Tomorrow, my Lord. Time goes on crutches till love have all his rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence a just seven night and a time too brief to, to have all things answer my mind. Come, you shake the head at so long a breathing, but I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will in the interim undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection, the one with the other I would fain to have it a match. I doubt not but to fashion it. If three will but minister such an assistance, I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you, though it cost me ten nights' watchings. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero? I forgot that she still had lines. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the unhopefulest husband that I know. Thus far can I praise him. He is of a noble strain, approved valor and confirmed honesty. I will teach you how to humor your husband that she shall fall in love with Benedict. And I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that in despite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter. Yeah, my lord, but I can cross it. Are any cross, any impediment will be medicinable to me. Uh, I am sick in displeasure to him, and whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst thou cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in me. Show me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to hero. I remember. I can, at any unreasonable instant of the night, Appoint her to look out at the lady's chamber window. What life is in that to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince, your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you might, whose estimation do you mightly hold up to a com contaminated, contaminated stale, such as one as hero. 
You got this, girl. What proof shall I make of that? Proof enough to misuse the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero, and to kill Leonardo. Look you for any other issue? Only to despite them, I will endeavor anything. Go then. Find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and the Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a kind of zeal, both to the prince and Claudio. As in love of your brother's honor, who hath made me this match, and his friend's reputation, who is thus like to be a cousin with the semblance of a maid, that you have discovered this. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero, hear Margaret turn me Claudio, and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty, the jealousy shall be called assurance and the preparation overthrown. Grow this to what adverse issue it can, I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be you consistent in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will presently go learn the way of their marriage, or learn the day of their marriage. Boy! Senor! In my chamber window lies a book. Bring it. Hither to me in the orchard. I'm here already, sir. I know that. I would have thee hence and here again. Hmm. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife. And now he would rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would walk 10 miles afoot to see a good armor. And now will he lie 10 nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet? He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose like an honest man and a soldier. And now he's turned orthography. His words are a very fantastical banquet. Just so many strange dishes may i be so converted and see with these eyes i cannot tell i think not i will not be sworn but love may transform me into an oyster but i'll take my oath on till he hath made an oyster of me he shall never make me such a fool one woman is fair yet i am well another is wise yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be, that's certain. Wise or our own man. Virtuous or I'll never cheapen her. Fair or I'll never look on her. Mild or come not near me. Noble, or an eye for an angel, of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be bra- of what color it please God. The prince and monsieur love, I will hide me in the arbor. Come, shall we hear this music? Ah, oh, yea, my good lord. How still the evening is, it's hushed on purpose to grace harmony. See you where Benedict hath hid himself. Very well, my lord. The music ended, we'll fit the kid fox with a pennyworth. <sighs> Come, Balthasar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, what? Oh, my good lord. Tax not so bad a voice to slander music any more than once. 
It is the witness still of excellency to put a strange face on his own perfection. I pray thee, sing and let me woo no more. Because you talk of wooing, I will sing. Since many a wooer doth commence his suit. To her he thinks not worthy, yet he woos. Yet will he swear he loves. Nay, pray thee come. <clears throat> or if thou wilt hold longer argument, do it in notes. Note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine that's worth the noting. Why, these are very croquettes that he speaks. <sighs> notes, notes, forsooth and nothing. Now, diviner, now is his soul ravaged. Is that not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? Well, a horn for my money when all's done. Sigh no more, ladies, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. One foot in sea and one on shore. To one thing constant never. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. Sing no more ditties, sing no more, of dumps so dull and heavy. The fraud of men was ever so, since summer first was levy. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. By my troth, a good song. And an ill singer, my lord. Ha, no, no, faith, thou singest well enough for a shift. I fear but a dog that would have howled thus, they'd have hanged him. I pray God his bad voice bode no mischief. I had life and heard the night raven come up, plague would come after it. Yea, merits thou hear Balthazar? I pray thee get some excellent music for tomorrow night. We will have it at the Lady Hero's chamber window. <clears throat> the best I can, my lord. Do so. Farewell. Come hither, Lenato. <clears throat> what was it you told me of today uh, that your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? Oh, I stock on, stock on the falsets. I never did think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I neither. Wonderful that she sh should so dot on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behaviors seem ever to abhor. It's possible. Sits the wind on that corner. By my troth, my lord, I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection, it is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth but counterfeit. Faith, I like enough. Oh, God, counterfeit. There was never counterfeit of passion came so near the life of passion as she discovers it. Why, what effects of passion shows she? <laughs> well, this fish will bite. What effects, my lord? She will sit you. You heard my daughter tell you how. Oh, she did indeed. How? How, I pray you. You amaze me. I would have thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had my lord especially against Benedict. I should think this is a gobble that the white-bearded fellow speaks it. Never he cannot sure hide himself in such reverence. <laughs> Here, take the infection. Hold it. Hold it up. Have she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and swears she never will. That's her torment. Tis true indeed. So your daughter says, shall I, says she, that have so often countered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This she says now when she is beginning to write to him, for she'll be up 20 times a night, and then will she sit in her smock till she have writ a sheet of paper? My daughter tells us. Oh. Now you talk of a sheet of paper. Oh, I remember a pretty jest your daughter told us of. Oh, when she had writ it and was reading it over, she found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheet. <laughs> that. 
Oh, she tore the letter into thousands of halfpence, railed it at herself that she should be so immodest to write to one that she knew that would flout her I measure him, says she, by my own spirit, for I shall flaunt him if, I, if he write to me. Yea, I thought I love him, I should. And then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. She doth indeed, my daughter says so, and the ecstasy hath so much overborne her that my daughter is sometimes afraid she will do a desperate outrage to herself. It is very true. It were good that Benedict knew of it by some other if she will not discover it. But to what end? He would make but a sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. And he should. It were an aim's alms to hang her, hang him. She's an excellent, sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. And she is exceedingly wise. In everything but in loving Benedict. Oh, my Lord. Wisdom and blood combating in so tender a body. We have ten proofs to one that blood hath the victory. I am sorry for her, as I have just caused being her uncle and her guardian. I would she have bestowed this dutage on me. I would have daffled, daffed all other respects and made her half myself. I pray you, Benedict, of it, and hear what he will say. Were it good, thank you? Hero thinks, surely she will die. For she says she will die if he loves her not, and she will die ere she makes her love known. And she will die if... He woo her rather than she will bait one breath of her accustomed crossness. She doth well. If she should make tender her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it. Mm. For the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. He is a very proper man. Mm -hmm. He hath indeed a good outward happiness. <laughs> Before God and in my mind, <laughs> very wise. He doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit and i take him to be valiant as hector i assure you and in the managing of quarrels you may say he is wise for either he avoids them with great discretion or undertakes them with utmost christian-like fear if he do fear god he must necessarily keep peace if he break the peace he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling and so will he do. And for the man doth fear God. However, however, so, howsoever, it seems not in him by some large jest he will make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Well... We will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish him, wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy so good a lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. <laughs> if you do not dote upon her, on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. Let there be some net spread for her. And that must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry. The sport will be that they hold one in opinion of another's dotage and not such matter. That's the scene I would see, which would be merely a dumb show. Let us send her to call him in a dinner. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. Hmm. It seems her affection have their full bent. Love me. Why? I mean, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I must bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that you would rather die than give any sign of affection. I'd, I'd never think to marry. You know, I must not be proud. Happy are those that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. 
tis the truth. I can bear them witness. And virtuous, tis so, I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. By my troth, that is no addition to her wit, no nor great argument of her folly. For I will be horribly in love with her. <laughs> I may chance have had some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage, but doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences in these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humour? No. The world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I would live till I were married. Oh, here comes Beatrice. By this day, she is a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Against my will, I am set to bid you come to dinner. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pain. I took no more pains for those things than you take pains to thank me. It, if it had been painful, I would not have come. <laughs> take pleasure then in the message. Nay, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point, and choke a doll with all. You have no stomach, senor. Very well. <laughs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity on her, of her, I'm a villain. If I do not love her, I'm a fool. I will go get her picture. Good Margaret. Run thee to the parlor. There shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice proposing with the prince and Claudio. Whisper her ear and tell her I and Ursula walk in the orchard and our whole discourse is all of her. Say that thou overhearst us and bid her steal into the peached bower where honeysuckles ripened by the sun forbid the sun to enter like favorites made proud by princes that advance their pride against that power that bred it. Uh, there, there, there will she hide herself uh, to listen to our purpose. This is thy office. Fare thee well in it and leave us alone. I'll make her come, I warrant you, presently. Now, Ursula, when Beatrice doth come. As we do trace this alley up and down, our talk must only be of Benedict. When I do name him, let it be thy part to praise him more than ever man did merit. My talk to thee must be how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter is little Cupid's crafty arrow made that only wounds by hearsay. Now, begin. For, for look, Beatrice is like a lapwing runs close by the ground to hear our conference. Ah, the pleasant angling is to see the fish cut with her golden oars the silver stream and greedily devour. and greedily devour the treacherous bait. So angle we for Beatrice, who even now is couched in the woodbine coverture. Fear you not my part of the dialogue. Then go we near her, that her ear lose nothing of the false sweet bait that we lay for it. No, truly Ursula, she is too disdainful. 
I know her spirits are as coy and wild as haggards of the rock. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new troubled lord. And did they bid you tell her of it, madam? Oh, they did entreat me to acquaint her of it, but I persuaded them if Benedict, if they loved Benedict, to wish him wrestle with affection and ne'er let Beatrice know of it. Why did you do so? Doth not the gentleman deserve as full of fortunate a bed as ever Beatrice shall couch upon? Oh, God of love! I know he doth deserve as much may be yielded to a man, but nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. Disdain and scorn ride sparkling in her eyes, misprizing what they look on, and her wit values itself so highly that to her all matter else seems weak. She cannot love nor take no shape, nor project of affection. She is so self-endeared. Sure, I think so. And therefore, certainly it were not good. She knew his love lest she make sport at it. <laughs> Why, you speak truth. I never saw such, never saw, uh, I never yet saw man. How wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured, but she would spell him backwards. If fair face, she would swear the gentleman should be her sister. If black, why nature, drawing of an antic. Made foul plot, if tall, a lance ill-headed. If low, an agate very vilely cut. If speaking, why vain blown all the winds if silent why a block moved with none so turns she every man to the wrong side out and never gives to the truth and virtue that which simpleness and merit purchaseth sure sure such carping is not commendable no not to be so odd and from all fashions as beatrice's cannot be commendable but who dare tell her so? If I should speak, oh, she would mock me into the air. Oh, she would laugh at me out of myself and press me to death with wit. Therefore, let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in sighs, waste inwardly. It were a better death than die with mocks, which is as bad as die with tickling. <laughs> Yet, tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No. Rather, I will go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion. And truly, I devise some honest slanders to stain my cousin with. One doth not know how much an ill word may empo empoison liking. Oh, do not do your cousin such a wrong she cannot be so much without true judgment, having so swift and excellent a wit as she is prized to have as to refuse so rare a gentleman as Signor Benedict. He is the only man of Italy, always accepted, my dear Claudio. I pray you not be angry with me, madam. Speaking my fancy, Signor Benedict, uh, for shape, for bearing, argument and valor, goes foremost in report through Italy. Indeed, he hath an excellent good name. His excellence did earn it ere he had it. When were you married, madam? Uh, why, every day tomorrow. Come, go in. I shall, I'll show thee some, some attires and have thy counsel, which is the best to furnish me tomorrow. She's limed, I warrant you. We have caught her, madame. If it proves so, then loving goes by haps. Some cupids kill with arrows and some with traps. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Soon I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell, and Maiden pride to do. No glory lives behind the back of such and Benedict love on. 
I require thee. Taming my wild heart to thy loving hand, if thou dost love my kindness, shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reporting thee. I do but stay until your marriage is con consummated, and then go I towards Aragon. I'll bring with you thither, my lord, if you'll vouchsafe me. Nay, that would be a great as a soil to the new gloss of your marriage as to show a child his new coat and forbid him to wear it. If will on I will only be bold with Benedict for his company, for from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, he is all mirth. He hath twice or thrice cut Cupid's bowstring, and the little hangman dare not shoot at him. He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is a clapper. For what is his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. Gallant, uh, <laughs> I am not as I have been. Travis. Yeah, Travis. Oh, so I say, methinks you are sad? Yes, you do. Yes. So I say, methinks you are sad. I hope he be in luck. Hang him, Trunt. There is no true drop of blood in him that's truly touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. I have the toothache. Draw it. Hang it. Oh, you must hang it first and draw it afterwards. What? Sigh for the toothache? Where is but a humor or a worm? Well, everyone can master a grief, but he has, uh, but that uh, has it. <laughs> Yet I say, he is in love. There is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be fancy that he has a strange disguises as to be a Dutchman today, a Frenchman tomorrow, or in the shape of two countries at once as a German from the waist down all slops and a Spaniard from the hip up and no doublet. Unless he have a fancy to his foolery, as it appears he hath, he is no fool for fancy, as you would have it, have it appears he is. If he be not in love with some woman, there is no believing old signs. He brushes his hat of mornings. What should that bode? Hath any man seen him at the barber's? No, but the barber's man hath been seen with him, and the old ornament of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. Indeed, he looks younger than he did by the loss of a beard. Nay, he rubs himself with a civet. <laughs> Can you smell him out by that? That's as much to say, the sweet youth's in love. The greatest note of its melancholy. And when was he wont to wash his face? Yea, or to paint himself? For the which I hear what they say of him. And nay, but his jesting spirit, which is now crept into a lute string and now governed by stops. Indeed, that tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude, he is in love. And nay, but I know who loves him. <laughs> that would I know too. I warrant one that knows him not. Yes, and his ill conditions, and despite of all, dies for him. She shall be buried with her face upward. Yet yeah, this is no charm for the toothache. Old Signor, walk with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak with you, which these hobby horses must not hear. For my life, to break with him about Beatrice. It is even so. He and Margaret have by this played their parts with Beatrice, and then the two bears will not bite one another when they meet. My lord and brother, God save you. Good evening, brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private? If it please you. Yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow? You know he does. I know not that, when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, I pray you, discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter, and aim better at me by that I will now will manifest her. Manifest. She's making up words. For my brother, I think he holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hope to effect your ensuing marriage. 
surely suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. Why? What's the matter? I came hither to tell you in circumstances shortened, for she has been too long a talking of. The lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Even she. Leonardo's hero. Your hero. Every man's hero. Disloyal. The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Think you of worse uh, title, and I will fit her to it. Wonder not till further warrant. Go, but with me tonight. Uh, you shall see her chamber window entered, even the night before her wedding day. If you love her, then, tomorrow, wed her. But if it would be better if you uh, honor... Oh, ooh, if you honor to change your mind. Could this be so? I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you see, confess. Not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you yet enough. Uh, show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight, why well, should not marry her? Tomorrow in the congregation, where I should wed, there will I shame her. And as I would for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no further until you are uh, my witnesses. Hear it coldly, but till midnight, and let the issue show itself. O oh, day untowardly turned. O oh, mischief strangely thwarting. O oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel. Are you good men and true? Yea, or else it be pity, but they should suffer salvation, body and soul. Nay, that were a punishment too good for them, if they should have any allegiance in them, being chosen for the prince's watch. Well, give them their charge. Neighbor Dogberry. First, who think you the most desartless man to be constable? Ah, you outcake, sir. George Seacole, for they write and read. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. God hath blessed you with a good name. To be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Both which, Master Constable? You have. I knew it would be your answer. Well, for your favor, sir, why, give God thanks and make no boast of it. And for your writing and reading, let that appear when there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be the most senseless and fit man for the constable of the watch. Therefore, bear you the Latin. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrom men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. And how if he will not stand? Why then, take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together, and thank God you are rid of a knave. If he will not stand when he is bidden, is none of the prince's subjects? True, and they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You shall also make no noise in the streets, for for the watch to babble and talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. Oi, second watchman. Yeah, I think I forgot. Oh, Oi, she's here. I'm sorry. Uh, we will rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. Why? You speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only ever care that your bills be not stolen. Well, you are to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed. How if they will not? Why then, let them alone till they are sober. If they make you not then the better answer, you may say they are not the men you took them for. Well, sir. If you meet a thief, you may suspect him, by virtue of your office, to be no true man, 
And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why? The more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly, by your office you may. But I think they that touch pitch will be defiled. Mm. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. You have always been called a merciful man, partner. Truly. I would not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her still. How if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why? Then depart in peace, and let the child wake her with crying. For the you that will not hear the lamb when it buys will never answer a calf when he bleats. Tis very true. This is the end of the charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay him. Nay, by a lady, I think you cannot. Five shillings to one on it. With any man that knows the statutes, he may stay him. Mary, not without the prince be willing, for indeed the watch ought to defend no man, and it is an offence to stay a man against his will. By our lady, I think it'd be so. <laughs> <laughs> well, masters, good night. And there be any matters of weight chances, call at me. Keep your fellow's counsels and your own, and good night. Come, neighbor. Well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench till two, and then all to bed. Oh, one word more, honest neighbors. I pray you watch about Signor Leonardo's door, for the wedding be there tomorrow. There is a great coil tonight. Adieu, be vigilant. I beseech you. What, Conrad? Peace, stir not. Conrad, I say. Sorry, technical difficulties. Here, man, I am at thy elbow. Bess, and my elbow itched. I thought there would a scab follow. I will owe thee an answer for that. And now forward with thy tale. Send it close then under this penthouse for Jizzle's reign, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treason, masters, that stand close. Therefore, no, I have earned of Don John a thousand ducats. Is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? Thou shouldst rather ask if it were possible any villainy should be so rich. For when rich villains have need of poor ones, Poor ones may make what price they will. I wonder at it. <laughs> that shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet or a hat or a cloak is nothing to a man. Yes, it is apparel. I mean the fashion. Yes, the fashion is the fashion. <laughs> I may as well say the fool's the fool. But seest thou not what a deformed thief this fashion is? I know that deformity. He has been a vile thief this year. He goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. Did thou not hear somebody? No, t'was the vein on the house. Hmm. Seest thou not, I say, what a deformed thief this fashion is. How giddily he turns about all the hot bloods between 14 and 530. Sometimes fashioning them like pharaoh soldiers in the Ricci painting. Sometimes like God, bells, pr priests, and the old church window. Sometimes like the shaven Hercules in the smirked, warm-eaten tapestry, where his codpiece seems as massy as his club. All this I see. And I see that the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. But art thou not, art not thou thyself giddy with the fashion too? That thou hast shifted out of thy tale into telling me of the fashion? Not so neither, but know that I have tonight wooed Margaret, the lady hero's gentlewoman by the name of Hero. She leans me out, her mistress, 
Uh, she leans me out at her mistress chamber window, bids me a thousand times good night. I tell this tale, Wiley. I should first tell thee how the prince Claudio, my master planted and placed and possessed by, ma by my master, Don John, saw far in the orchard this amiable, uh, amiable encounter. And thought they Margaret was hero? Two of them did, the prince and Claudio. But the devil, my master, knew she was Margaret. And partly by his oaths, which first possessed them, partly by the dark night, which did deceive them, but chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm any slander that Don John had made, away went Claudio, engraved, swore he would meet her as soon as he was appointed next morning at the temple. And there before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw overnight and send her home again without a husband. Bollocks, we charge you in the prince's name. Stand! Call up the right master constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of lettery that ever was known in the Commonwealth. And when the farmer is one of them, I know him, he wears an oak. Masters, masters! You'll be made bring the farmer, war. I warrant you. <laughs> You're With my ridiculous accents. I don't know where it's from. Masters. Never speak. Shit. <laughs> we charge you. Let us obey you to go with us. We are like to prove a goodly commodity being taken up by these men's bills. A commodity in question, I warrant you. Come, we'll obey you. Hero? Yes. I, I had the wrong screen open. Okay. Mm. Good Ursula, wake my cousin Beatrice and desire her to rise. I will, my lady. And bid her come hither. Well. Oh, I, I, I think your other rubato were better. No, pray thee, good Meg, I'll wear this. By my truth, not so good, and I warrant your cousin will say so. My cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. I like the new tire with an excellency. If the hair were a thought browner in your gowns a most rare fashion, my faith. I saw the Duchess of Milan's gown that they praised so. Oh, that exceeds, they say. By my truth, but a nightingown gown in respect of yours. Cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls down the sleeves, and skirts round underbone with a bl bluish tensile. But for a fine, quaint, graceful, and excellent fashion, yours is worth ten on it. <laughs> well, God give me joy to wear it. For my heart is exceedingly heavy. Twas be heavier soon by the weight of a man. Ah, oh, fie upon thee! Art thou not, not ashamed? Of what, lady? Of speaking honorably? Is not marriage honorable in a beggar? Is not your lord honorable without marriage? I think you would have me say, saving your reverence, a husband. And bad thinking do not rest true speaking. I'll offend nobody. Is there any harm in the heavier for a husband? None, I think. And it be the right husband and the white rife. Otherwise, it is light and not heavy. Ask my lady Beatrice else. Here she comes. Good morrow, cuz. Good morrow, sweet hero. Why, how now? Do you speak in the sick tune? I am out of all other tune, methinks. Claps into light, O oh love, that goes without a burden. Do you sing it and I'll dance it. 
you light a love with your heels, then if you haven't have sta your husband have stables enough, you'll see shellac no barns. Oh, illegitimate construction. I scorn that with my heels. It's almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my troth, I am exceeding ill. Oh. For a hawk, a horse, or a husband. It's a letter that begins with them all. H. Well, then you be not turned turk. There's no more sailing by the star. What means the foul tro? Nothing I, but God send everyone their heart's desire. What was that hero? These, these, these gloves the Count sent me. They are an excellent perfume. Ugh, I'm stuffed, cousin. I cannot smell. A maid and stuffed, there is goodly catching of cold. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> help me. How long have you professed apprehension? Ever since you left it, doth not my wit become me rarely? It's not seen enough. You should wear it in your cap, I trust. I am sick. Use some of this distilled Cardis Benedictus and lay it in your heart. It is the only thing for a qualm. There, thou prickster with a thistle. Benedictus? Why Benedictus? You have some moral in this Benedictus? Moral? No, by my truth, I, I have no moral meaning. I meant plain holy thistle. You may think perchance that I think you are in love. Nay, by our lady, I, I am not such a fool to, I, I'm not such a fool to think what I list, nor I list not to think what I can, nor indeed I cannot think. If I would think my heart out of thinking that you are in love or that you will be in love or that you can be in love, yet Benedict was such another and now is he become a man? He swore he would never marry. And yet now in despite of his heart, he eats his meat without grudging. And how you may be converted, I not know, but methinks you look uh, with your eyes as other women do. What pace is this that thy tongue keeps? Not a false gallop. Madam, withdraw the prince, the count, Signor Benedict, Don John, and all the galleons of the town are come to fetch you to church. Help to dress me, good cause, good Meg, good Ursula. The five, what would you be with honest neighbor? What would you with me, honest neighbor? Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Brief, I pray you, for you see it is a busy time with me. Mary, this is this it is, sir. Yes, in truth it is, sir. What is it, my good friends? Good man Burgess, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old man, sir, and his wits are not so blunt as, God help, I would desire they were, but in faith, honest as the skin between his brows. Yes, I thank God I'm honest as a man living as old. <laughs> He's living in this freaking country shit. I would desire they were, but if, uh, now I'm reading the wrong line. Uh, call me Jen. Yes, I thank God I'm honest man as any living as the old man, no honester than I. <laughs> Comparisons are odorous, palabras, neighbor virgis. Neighbors, you are tedious. It pleases your worship to say so, but we are the poor duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow, bestow it all of your worship. All thy tediousness on me, eh? Yea, and twere a thousand pound more than this. For I hear as good exclamation on your worship as of any man in the city, 
and though I be but a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain, fain now what you have to say. Marry, sir, a watch tonight, except your worship presence, hearten a couple of errant knaves that in Messina. A good old man, sir, he will be talking. As they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. God help us, it is a world to see. Well said, in faith, neighbor Virgis. Well, God's a good man, and two men ride of a horse, one must ride behind. An honest soul, in faith, sir, by my troth he is, as ever broke bread. But God is to be worshipped. All men are not alike, alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Gifts that God gives. I must leave uh, you. One word, sir. I'll watch, sir have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination yourself and bring me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be suffigence. Drink some wine ere you go. Fare you well. Just... Uh, uh, my lord. My no lord, thank you. I believe I'm the messenger? Yes? Wait, are you? Oh, sorry. I was trying to kill a bug. <laughs> Damn it, Travis. <laughs> Damn it, Travis! <laughs> My lord. They stay for you to give your daughter to her husband. Well, then I'll wait upon them. I am ready. Go, good partner, go. Get you to Francis Seco. Bid him bring his pen and ink horn to the jail. We are now to examination these men. Now we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit, I warrant you. Here's that shall drive some of them to a non-com. Only get the learned writer to set down our excommunication and meet me at the jail. Come. Friar Lawrence, be brief, only to plain form. Wrong words. play, you asshole! My name is Francis! Jesus oh, Friar fucking Francis. Christ! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, when they start. Anyway, Friar Francis, I got confused with your cousin. Uh, he briefly, only to the plain uh, plain form of marriage, and you shall recount their, uh, recount their particular duties afterwards. Don't take it too personal. Well, I'm sorry. It's a good news thing that I did not have my mic on, so I could not have sworn at you for how much I was angry that you called me Friar Lawrence! Anyway, you come hither, okay, my okay. lord, to marry this lady. Shut up, you asshat. Come again, Friar Francis. I'm so sorry. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady? No. To be married to her, Friar, you come to marry her. Ah, lady, you come hither to be married to this count? I do. If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, I charge you on your souls to utter it. Know you any hero? None, my lord. Know you, you any count? Me. That's my it. line, you fuck. I dare make his answer none. Oh, what men dare do. What men may do. What men daily do, not knowing what they do. Oh, now interjections. Uh, why then some of laughing is ha ha he. Stand by thee, friar. Father, by your leave, will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her name. And what have I to give you back whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble, noble thankfulness. There, Leonato, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. 
Behold, how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all. Comes not that blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear all you that see her that she were a maid by these exterior shows? <laughs> but she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married, not to knit my soul to an approved wanton. Dear my lord, if you in your own proof have vanquished the resistance of her youth and made defeat of her virginity. I know what you would say. If I have known her, you will say she did embrace me as a husband and so extenuate the for forehand sin. No, Leonato. I never tempted her with word too large, but as a brother to his sister showed bashful sincerity and comely love. Seemed to I ever otherwise to you? So out on seeming, I will write against it. You seem to me as Diane and her orb, as chaste as is the bud ere it were be born, blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well that he doth speak so wide? Sweet prince, why, sp why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that I have gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are these things spoken or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. True. Oh, God. Not so. Stand I here? Is this the prince? Is this the prince's brother? Is this face heroes? Are our eyes our own? All this is so, but what of this, my lord? Let me but move one question to your daughter, and by that fatherly and kindly power that you have in her, bid her answer truly. I charge thee do so, as thou art my child. Oh, God, defend me! How am I beset? What kind of catechizing call you this? To make you answer truly to your name. Is it not hero? Who can blot that name with any just reproach? Mary, that can hero. Hero itself can blot out hero's virtue. What man was he talked with you yesternight out of your window betwixt 12 and one? Now, if you are a maid, answer to this. I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Then why then are you no maiden? Leonato, I'm sorry you must hear. Upon mine honor, myself, my brother, and this grieved count did see her, hear her, at that hour last night, talk with a ruffian at her chamber window, who hath indeed, most like a liberal villain, confessed the vile encounters they have had a thousand times in secret. Fie, fie, they are not to be named, my lord not to be spoke of. There is no chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. Oh, hero, what a hero hadst thou been if half thy outward graces had been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure impiety and impious purity. For thee I'll lock up all the gates of love, and on my eyelid shall conjecture hang to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall it more be gracious. That's no man's dagger here, here a point for me. Why? <laughs> oh no, cousin, wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. These things come thus to light. Smother her spirits up. How doth the lady? That I think. Help, uncle! <laughs> Why, your uncle? <laughs> Sir Benedict Friar! Oh, fate, take not away the heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame. That may be wished for. Oh, now, cousin hero. 
Have comfort, lady. Shit. Bitch, that's head. my line, you fuck. Have comfort, lady. And now I say, dost thou look up? Yet, where sure, wherever should she not? Where are, wherefore, why doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that is printed in her blood? Do not live, hero. Do not ope thine eyes, for did I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Though I, thy spirits were stronger than myself, would be the rearward of reapproaches. Strike at thy life, grieved. I, I, by one, chide for a lady's frame. Oh, too much by thee. Why, I had one. Why ever wast thou lovely in my eyes? Why had I with terrible hand took up a beggar's issue at my gates? Whose murder with infamy, infamy, I might have said no part of it. This shame diverts itself unknown loins. But mine and mine, loved and mine, praised and mine, that was so proud on mine, so much that I myself was to myself, not mine, valuing of her, why she, oh, she's fallen into a bit of ink, that wide sea hath dropped to a few, wash her clean again, and salt to which many seasons give her to foul tamed flesh. Sir, sir, be patient. For my part, I am so tired in wonder, I, I know not what to say. Oh, what my soul, my cousin, is be like. Lady, were you at her bed fiddle last night? No, truly not. Uh, although until last night, I, I have this 12 month been her bedfellow. Confirmed, confirmed. Oh, that is stronger maid, which was before barred up with ribs of iron, whom the two princes lie and Claudio lie, who loved her so that speaking of her foulness, washed it with tears. Hence from her, let her die. Hear me a little, for I have only silent been so long and given way this unto this course of fortune. By noting of the lady, I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face, a thousand innocent shames. An angel whiteness speed away those blushes, and in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the errors that these princes hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool. Trust not my reading, nor my observations, which, with experimental seal, doth warrant the tenor of my book. Trust not my age, my reverence, calling, or nor divinity. If this sweet lady lie not guiltless here under some biting error. Friar, it cannot be thou seest that all the grace that she hath left is that she will not add to her damnation, a sin of perjury. She not denies it, why seekest thou them to cover with excuse that which appears in proper nakedness? Lady, what man is he that you are accused of? They know that to accuse me, I know none. If I know more of any man alive than that which maiden modesty doth warrant, let all my sins lack mercy. Oh, my father, prove you that any man with me conversed at hours unmet, or that I yesternight ma maintained the, the change of words with any creature, refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. There is some strange misprison, uh, misprision in the princes. Few of them have the very bent of honor. And if their wisdoms be misled in this, practice of it lives in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil in frame of villainies. No, not if they speak but truth of her. These hands shall tear her if they wrong her honor, the proudest of them all. Of them shall we hear of it. Time hath not yet so dried this blood of mine, nor age so eat up my in invention, nor fortune made such havoc of my means. Nor my bad left refts me so much of friends, but they shall find me awaked in such a kind, both of strength of limb and policy of mind, ability and means and choice of friends, to quit me of them thoroughly. Pause a while, and let my counsel away you in this case. Your daughter here, the prince is left for dead. Let her a while be secretly kept in, 
and publish it that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourning orientation, and on your family's old monument, hang mournful epitaphs and do all rites that appertain unto a burial. What shall become of this? What will this do? Mary, this will carried shall on her behalf change slander to remorse. That is some good. But not for that dream I on this strange course, but on this travel, a uh, travail, look for greater birth. She, dying, as it is so, must be so maintained, upon the instant that she was accused, shall be lamented, pitied, and excused of every hearer. For it so falls out that she, we, what we have, we prize not to the world. Whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked in lust, why then we rack the value? Then we find the virtue that possession would not show us, whilst it was ours. So will it fare with Claudio, when he shall hear she died upon his words. The idea of her life shall sweetly, sweetly creep into his study of imagination, and every lovely organ of her life shall come appealed, uh, appareled, I'm sorry, more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul, that w then when she had lived indeed, then shall he mourn, if ever love and interest in his liver, and wish he had not accused her, no, Though he thought his accusation true, let this be so, and doubt not but success, will fashion the event in better shape. Then I can lay it down in likelihood, but if all aim but this leveled false, the supposition of this lady's death will quench the wonder of her infamy, and if it sort not well, you may conceal her, as best befits her wounded reputation in some reclusive and religious life, out of all eyes, tongues, minds, and injuries. Signor Leonato, let the friar advise you. And though you may know my inwardness and love is very much unto the prince and Claudio, yet by mine honor I will seal, I will deal in this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow in grief, the smallest twine may lead me. The well consented, presently away. For two strange sores, strangely they strain the cure. Come, lady, die to live. This wedding day, perhaps, is but prolonged. Have patience and endure. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yeah, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wrong. Uh, how much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? Very even way. No such friend. May a man do it. Is it a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world as well as you. Is that not strange? Uh, as strange as the thing, I know not. It were as possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not. And yet I lie not. I, I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I, I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Oh, do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat uh, it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it. I protest I love thee. Why then? God forgive me. What offence, sweet Beatrice? You stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. 
kill Claudio. <laughs> Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Terry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, pray. You let me go. Beatrice. In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height of a villain that hath slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man, what bear her in hand until they come back to t or come to take hands and then with public accusation uncover slander, unmitigated rancor. God, for that I am man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. Talk with a man out a window, a proper saying. Nay, but Beatrice. We hero is wronged and she is slandered. She's un. Done. Yeah. Beatrice. Princes and countries. Surely a princely Testonia, a goodly count, count confect, a sweet gallant, surely. Oh, that I were a man for his sake, or that I may find, uh, that I may friend, uh, that any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into curtsies and, and valor and comfort, compliment and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing. Therefore, I will die as a woman with grieving. Very good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that Count Claudio hath wrong hero? Yea, as sure as I have thoughts, or a soul. Enough, I'm engaged. I will challenge him. I'll kiss your hand, and so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear me, so think of me. Go comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead, and so farewell. Right. Is our whole assembly appeared? Oh, a stew and a cushion for the sexton. Which be the male factors? Mary, that I am, and my partner. Nay, a certain. We have the expedition to examine. But which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yea, Mary, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Boraccio. Pray, write down Boraccio. Your, sir? I am a gentleman, sir, and my name is Conrad. Write down Master Gentleman Conrad, Masters, do you serve God? Yea, sir, we hope. Write down that they hope they serve God, and write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters, it is proved already that you are little better than false knaves. And it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. A marvellous witty fellow, I assure you. But I will go about with him. Come you hither, sirrah, a word in your ear. Sir, I say to you, it is thought you are false knaves. Sir, I say to you... We are none. Well, stand aside. For God, they are both in a tale. Have you writ down that they are none? Master Constable, you go not the way to examine. 
you must call forth the watch that are their accusers. Yay, Mary, that's the F this way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you in the prince's name, accuse these men. Oh, that's me, the spam said, sir. Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Why, this is flat perjury to call a prince's brother villain. Oh, all right, <clears throat> Master Constable. Pray thee, fellow, peace. I do not like thy look, I what? promise thee. What heard you him say else? Mary, that he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady hero wrongfully. Flat burglary as ever was committed. Hey, my mass, that it is. What else, fellow? And that Count Claudio did me a poor his words to disgrace hero before the whole assembly and not marrying her. Oh, villain! Thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this. What else? This is all. And this is more, masters, than you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Hero is in this manner accused and in this very manner refused. And upon the grief of this suddenly died. Master Constable, let these men be bound and brought to Lenatos. I will go before and show him their examination. Come, let them be opinioned. Let them be in the hands. Off, coxcomb. God, my life, where's this sexton? Let him write down the prince's officer coxcomb. Tom, bind them, thou naughty varlet. Away, you are an ass. You are an ass. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that ye were here to write me down an ass. But masters, remember that I am an ass, though it be not written down. Yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and, which is more, an officer, and, which is more, a householder, and, which is more, as pretty a piece of flesh as any is in Messina. And one that knows the law, go to, and a rich fellow enough, go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns, and everything handsome about him. Oh, bring him away. Oh, that I had been writ down an arse. <laughs> If you go on thus, you will kill yourself, and tis not wisdom thus to second grief against yourself. I pray thee, cease thy counsel, which falls into mine ears as profitless as water in a sieve. Give not me counsel, counsel nor let me no comfort delight mine ear, but such a one whose wrongs do suit with mine. Bring me a father that so loved his child, whose joy of her is overwhelmed like mine, and bid him speak of patience. Measure his woo the length and breadth of mine, and let it answer every strain of forestrain, as thus for thus, and such a grief for such, in every lament, branch, shape, and form, if such a one will smile and his beard, bid sorrow wag cry him when he should groan, patch grief with proverbs, make misfortune drunk with candle washers, Bring him yet to me, and I of him will gather patience, but there is no such man. For brother men can counsel and speak comfort to that grief, which thy themselves 
not feel but tasting it their counsel turns to passion which before would give a pristable med a medicine to rage fetter with strong madness in a silken thread charm ache with air and agony with words no 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 tis all men's office to speak patience to who's that ring under the load of sorrow but no man's virtue nor suff uh, sufficiency to be so moral when she shall endure the like himself therefore give me no counsel my griefs cry louder than advertisement. Therein do men from children nothing differ? I pray thee peace, I will be flesh and blood, for there was never yet a philosopher that couldn't endure the truth patiently. However, they have writ the style of gods and made a push at chance and sufferance. Yet bend not all the harm upon yourself. Make those that do offend you suffer too. There, there thou speakest reason. Nay, I will do so. My soul doth tell me, hero is field, and that shall Claudio know, so, so shall the prince and all of them that thus dishonor her. Here comes the prince and Claudio hastily. I will say again, how? Here comes the uh, Prince and Claudio hastily. Oh, Prince. I must have missed a line. I'm on the wrong page. I'm sorry. All good. Uh, no. Except good in, good in. Good day to both of you. Hear you, my lords. We have some haste, Lenato. Some haste, my lord. Well, fare you well, my lord. Are you so hasty now? We, well, all is one. Nay, do not quarrel with us, good old man. If, if he could ride himself with quarreling, some of us would lie low. Who wrongs him? Mary. Thou dost wrong me, though dis uh, dissembler thou, nay, never lay thy hand upon thy sword, I fear thee not. Mary, beshrew my hand, if it should give your age such cause of fear. In faith, my hand meant nothing to my sword. Tush, tush, man, never fleer and jest at me. I speak not like a dotard nor a fool, as an underprivilege of age to brag. What I have done being young, or what would do were I not old? known claudio to thy head thou hast so wronged mine innocent child and me that i am forced to lay my reverence by and with gray hairs and bruised of many days do challenge thee to trial of a man i say thou hast failed my innocent child thy slander hath gone through and through her heart and she lies buried with her ancestors oh in a tomb where never scandal slept save these of hers framed by the villainy my villainy thine claudio thine i say you say not right old man my lord my lord i'll prove it on his body if he dare despite his niece fence and his active practice his may of youth and bloom of lustelhood away i will not have to do with you since thou so daft me, thou hast killed my child. If thou killed me, boy, thou shalt kill a man. You shall kill two of us, and men indeed. But that's no matter. Let him kill one first. Win me and wear me. Let him answer me. Come, follow me, boy. Come, sir, boy. Come, follow me. Sir, boy, I'll whip you from your foining fence. Nay. As I am a gentleman, I will. Brother. Ah! Content yourself. God knows I loved my niece, and she is dead, slandered to death by villains that dare as well answer a man indeed as I dare take a serpent by the tongue. Boys, apes, braggarts, jacks, milksaps. Brother Anthony. <laughs> Hold you content. What man? 
I know them, yea, and <laughs> what they weigh, even to the utmost scruple, scrambling, outfacing, fashion-mongering boys that lie and cog and flout, deprave and slander, do in <laughs> antiquely, I'm sorry, antiquely, and some outward hideousness, and speak of half a dozen dangerous words, dangerous, oh my goodness, uh, and how they might hurt their enemies if they durst, and this is all. But Brother Anthony... And come, come, tis no matter. Do you not med meddle? Let me deal in this. Gentlemen, both, we will not wake your patience. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death, but in my honor she was charged with nothing but what was true and very full of proof. My lord, my lord. I... I will not hear you. No? Come, brother, away. I will be heard. And shall, or some of us will be smart for it. See, see, here comes the man we went to seek. Ah, uh, now, senor, what news? Good day, my lord. Welcome, senor. You're almost come to part almost afraid. We'd like to have our, had our two noses snapped off with two old men without teeth. Lenato and his brother. What thinkest thou? Had we fought, I doubt we should have been too young for them. In a false quarrel, there is no true valor. I came to seek you both. We have been up and down to seek thee, for we are high-proof melancholy and would fain have a, a beaten away. Wilt thou use thy wit? It's in my scabbard. Shall I draw it? Doubt thou wear thy wit by thy side? Never any did so, though very many have been beside their wit. I will bid thee draw, as we do the minstrels. Draw to pleasure us. As I am an honest man, he looks pale. Art thou sick or angry? What courage, man? What though care killed the cat? Thou hast meddled enough in thee to kill care. Sir, I shall meet your wit uh, in, in the career and charge it against me. I pray you choose another subject. Ah, nay, then give him another staff. This last one's broke cross. This light, he changes more and more. I think he be angry indeed. If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. Shall I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I jest not, I will make it good how you dare, with what you dare and when you dare. Do me right or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. Well, I will meet you so I may have good cheer. What? A feast? A, a feast? If faith, I thank him. He hath bid me to a calf's head and a capon, the which if I do not carve most curiously, say my knife's not. Shall I not find a wood? Woodcock, too. Sir, your wit ambles well. It goes easily. I'll tell thee how Beatrice praised thy wit the other day. I said thou hast a fine wit, true. Said she a fine little one, no, said I, a great wit. Right, she said, a great gross one. Nay, said I, a good wit. Just, she said. It hurts nobody. Nay, said I, the gentleman is wise. Certain, said she, a wise gentleman. Nay, said I, he hath the tongues. That I believe, said she, for he swore a thing to me on Monday night, which he swore swore on Tuesday morning. There's a double tongues, there's two tongues. Thus, did she an hour together miss Transshape thy particular virtues. Yet at last she concluded with a sigh, thou wast the properest man in Italy. For the which she wept heartily and said she cared not. Yeah, and she did. Yet, but yet for all that, 
and if she did not hate him deadly, she would love him dearly, the old man's daughter told us all. All, all. And moreover, God saw him when he was hid in the garden. But when shall we set the savage bull's horns on the sensible Benedict's head? Yea, and text underneath, here dwells Benedict, the married man. Fare you well, boy. You know my mind. I will leave you now to your gossip-like humor. You break jests as braggarts do their blades, which, God be thanked, hurt not. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. Your brother, the bastard, is fled from Messina. You have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady. For my lord Lackbeard here, he and I shall meet until then. Peace be with him. He is in earnest. Most profound earnest. And I'll warn you for the love of Beatrice. And hath challenged thee? Most sincerely. What a pretty thing man is when he goes in his doublet and hose and leaves off his wit. He is then a giant to an ape. But then is an ape a doctor to such a man? But soft you, let me be. Pluck up my heart and be sad. Did he not say my brother was fled? Come you, sir, if justice cannot tame you. She shall ne'er weigh more reasons in her balance. Nay, and you be a cursing hypocrite once. You must be looked to. How now? Two of my brother's men bound. Braccio one. Harken after their offense, my lord. Officers, what offense have these men done? Marry, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Secondarily, they are slanders. Sixth and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things. And to conclude, they are lying knaves. First, I ask thee what they have done. Thirdly, I ask thee what's their offense. Sixth and lastly, why are they committed? And to conclude, what you lay to their charge. Rightly reasoned. And in his own division, and by my troth, there's one meaning well suited. Who of you offended, masters, that you are thus bound to your answer? This learned constable is too cunning to be understood. What is your offense? Wait, sorry, what page? I know it's the bottom of 82. 81. But, um, 81. Of 81. Okay, but I pulled it up um, on Facebook Messenger and it's just the PDF. So what's the top left say? All right. Sweet Prince, let me go no fur- farther to mine answer. Do you hear me and let this count kill me? I have deceived even your very eyes. What your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light, who in the night overheard me confessing to this man how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the lady hero. How you were brought into the orchard and saw me count Margaret and Hero's garments. How you disgraced her when you should marry her. My villainy they have upon recorded, which I had rather seal with my death than repeat over my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation. And briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Runs not this speech like iron through your blood. I have drunk poison whilst he uttered it. But did my brother set thee on this? Yeah, and paid me richly for the practice of it. He is composed in frame of treachery. And fled he upon this villainy. Sweet hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved it first. Come, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time our sexton hath reformed Signor Leonato of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. Hi. 
here, here comes Master Signor Linato and Sexton too. Is the villain? Let me see his eyes. That which I note in other men. And me. Uh, I got the whole line. I thought it was just me. If you would know your wronger, look on me. Art thou the slave that which thy breath has killed mine innocent child? Yeah, even I alone. No, not so villain thou speest my, thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. A third is fled. That had a hand in it. I thank you, prince. I thank you, princes, for my daughter's death. Record it with your high and worthy deeds. Twas bravely done, if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience, yet I must speak. I choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin. Yet sinned I not, but in mistaking by my soul nor i and yet to satisfy this good old man i would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoin me to I bid you bid my daughter live that were impossible but i pray you both thus the people in messina hear how an innocent she died and if you and if your love can Labor ought in sad invention. Hang her in an epitaph upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it tonight, tomorrow morning. Come you to my house, and since you could not be my son in law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost a co copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is her is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her sons. Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so does and so dies my revenge. Oh noble sir, your overkindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer and dispose for henceforth of poor Claudio. Tomorrow then, I will expect your coming tonight. I take my leave. This naughty man shall face to face be brought to Margaret, whom I, who I believe was packed in all this wrong. Hire it to buy your brother. No, by my soul she was not, nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me, but always have been just in virtuous in anything than I do know by her. Moreover, sir, which indeed is not under black and white, this plaintiff here, the offender, did call me an ass. I beseech you, let it be remembered in his punishment. And also, the watch heard them talk of one deformed. They say he wears a key in his ear and a lock hanging by it and borrows money in God's name the which he hath used so long and never paid, that now men grow hard-hearted and will lend nothing for God's sake. Pray you, examine him upon that point. I thank thee for thy care and honest pains. Your worship speaks like a most thankful and reverent youth, and I praise God for you. There's for thy pains. God save the foundation. Go. I discharge thee of thy prisoner, and I thank thee. I leave an errant knave with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself for the example of others. God keep your worship. I wish your worship well. God restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart. And if a merry meeting may be wished, God prohibit it. Come, neighbor. Until tomorrow morning, lords. Farewell.
Brother, where art thou? Jen. Farewell, my lords. We look for you tomorrow. We will not fail. Night, I'll mourn with hero. Bringing you these fellows on. We'll talk with Margaret. How her acquaintance grew with this lewd fellow. Pray thee, sweet Mistress Margaret, deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? In so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall come over it. For most comely truth uh, thou deservest it. Well, to have no man come over me? Why shall I always keep below stairs? Thy wit is quick as a greyhound's mouth. It catches. And yours is blunt as the fencer's foils, which hurt, which hit, but hurt not. The most manly wit, Margaret. It will not hurt a woman. And so I pray thee, call Beatrice. I give thee the bucklers. Give us the swords. We have bucklers of our own. If you use them, Margaret, you must put in the pikes with the vice. They are a dangerous weapon for maids. Well, I will call Beatrice to you, who I think hath legs. And therefore will come. The gods of love sing above and knows me and knows me. How pitiful. Right. I mean, I was singing, but in loving Leanna the Good Swimmer, Trollius the First Employer of the Pandras, and a whole book full of these quantum carpet mongers whose names yet run smoothly in the even road of blank verse why they were never so truly turned over and over as my poor self in love mary i cannot show it in rhyme i tried i can find out no rhyme to lady but baby an innocent rhymer for scorn a horn a hard rhymer for school fool a babbling rhyme very ominous endings Though I was born under a rhyming planet, nor I cannot woo in festival terms. Sweet Beatrice, would thou come when I called thee? Yea, ignore and depart when you bid me. Oh, stay but till then. <laughs> then is spoken. Fare you well now. Yet ere I go, let me go with that I came, which is without knowing what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words, and thereupon I will kiss thee. <laughs> foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is but, it's but noisome. Therefore I will depart unkissed. Thou hast frighted the word out of this sense so forcibly as thy wit. But I must tell thee plainly, Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward. And I pray thee now tell me, for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me? For them altogether, which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them? But for which of my good parts did you first suffer? Love me. Suffer love, a good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. <laughs> oh, in spite of your heart, I think. Well, as poor heart, if you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I aren't too wise to woo peaceably. Oh, it appears not in this confession. There's not one wise man among 20 that will praise himself. An old, old instance, Beatrice, that lived in the time of good neighbours. If a man do not erect in his age his own tomb ere he dies, he shall live no longer in monument when the bell rings and the widow weeps. And how long is that, think you? Question. Why an hour in clamour and a quarter in rain? Therefore, is the most expert uh, for the wise, if Don Worm, his conscience, finds no impediment to the contrary, to be the trumpet of his own virtues, as I am to myself. 
so much for praising himself, who I myself will bear witness, is praiseworthy. And now tell me, how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill too. Serve God, love me and mend. There will I leave you too, for here comes one in haste. Madam, you must come to your uncle, yonder's old coil at home. It is proved my lady hero hath been falsely accused, the prince and Claudio mightily abused, and Don John is the author of all. Who is fled and gone, will you come presently? Will you go hear this news, Signor? I will live in thy heart, die in thy lap, and be buried in thy eyes. And moreover, I will go with thee to thy uncles. Is this the monument of Leonato? It is, my lord. Done to death by slanderous tongues was the hero that here lies. Death, in guerdon of her wrongs, gives her fame, which never dies. So the life that died with shame lives in death with glorious fame. Hang thou there upon the tomb, praising her when I am dumb. Now music, sound, and sing your solemn hymn. Heart and goddess of the night, those that slew thy virgin night, for oh, the witch with songs of woe, Round about her tomb they go. Midnight, her sister woes. Help us to sigh and groan. Everly, Everly. Graves yawn and yield your dead till death be uttered. Heavily, heavily. Now unto thy bones, good night. Yearly will I do this right. Good morrow, masters, put your torches out. The wolves have prayed and look the gentle day before the wheels of Phoebus round about dapples the drowses east with spots of gray. Thank you to all and leave us. Fare you well. Good morrow, masters, each his several way. Come. Let us hence and put on other weeds, and then to Lenato's we will go. And Hymen now with luckier issue speeds than this for whom we rendered up this woe. Uh, did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio who accused her upon the error that you heard debated. But Margaret was in some fault for this, although against her will, as it appears in the true course of all the question. Well, I'm glad that all sorts things out. So am I. Being else by faith and forced to call young Claudio to a reckoning for it. Well, daughter, and you gentlewomen, all withdrawn to a chamber by yourselves, and when I send for you, come hither, masked. The prince and Claudio promised by this hour to visit me. You know your office, brother? You must be father to your brother's daughter, and give her to young Claudio. Which I do with confirmed continence. 
Friar, I must entreat your pains, I think. Uh, to do what, Signor? To bind me or undo me, one of them. Signor Leonato, truth is, good Signor, your niece regards me with an eye of favor. That eye, my daughter lent her, tis most true. And I do with an eye of love requite her. The sight where, whereof I think you had from me, from Claudio and the prince, but what's your will? Your answer, sir, is um, enigmatical. But for my will, my will is your good will, may stand with yours the day it be conjoined in the state of honorable marriage, in which, good friar, I shall desire your help. Heart is with your liking. And my help. Ah, here comes the prince and Claudio. Good morrow to this fair assembly. Good morrow, prince. Good morrow, Claudio. We here attend you. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I'll hold my mind where she in Ethiop. Call her forth, brother. Here's the friar ready. Good morrow, Benedict. Why, what's the matter? That you have such a February face, so full of frost, of storm, and cloudiness. I think he thinks upon the savage bull. Tush, fear not, man. We'll tip thy horns with gold, and all Europa shall rejoice at thee, as once Europa did at Leslie Jove, when he would play the noble beast in love. Bull Jove had an amiable low, and some strange bull leapt your father's cow, and caught a calf in the same noble feet, much like to you, for you, you have just his bleat. <laughs> For this I owe you. Here comes other reckonings. Which is the lady I must seize upon? The same, this same is she, and do give you her. Why then, she's mine. Sweet lady, let me see your face. No, that you shall not take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. Give me your hand before this holy friar. I am your husband, if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved, uh, and when you loved, <laughs> you were my other husband. Another hero. <laughs> Nothing certainer. Once hero died defiled, but I do live. And surely as I live, I am a maid. The former hero. Hero that is dead? She died, my lord, but whilst her slander lived. All this amazement can I qualify when after that the holy rites are ended. I'll tell you all largely a fair hero's death. Meantime, let wander, let wonder seem familiar, and to the chapel let us presently. Soft and fair, friar, which is Beatrice. I answer to that name. What is your will? Do not you love me? Why, no, no more than reason. Uh, why then your uncle? and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do not you love me? Troth, no. No more than reason. <laughs> Why then, cousin Margaret and Ursula are such deceived? For they did swear you did. They swore that you were almost sick for me. <gasps> they swore that you were well nigh dead for me. Tis no such matter. Then you do not love me. No, truly, but I'm friendly recompense. Come, cousin. I'm sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon it that he loves her. For here's a paper written in his hand, a halting sonnet of his own pure brain fashioned to Beatrice. And here's another. Writ in my cousin's hand, stolen from her pocket containing her affection unto Benedict. A miracle. Here's our own hand against our hearts. Look, come, I will have thee, but by this light I take thee for pity. 
I do not, I would not deny you, but by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion and partly save to your life. I was told you were in consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. <laughs> How dost thou benedict the married man? I tell thee what, Prince. A college of, wi- of wit crackers cannot flout me out of my humour. Dost thou think I care for your satire or an epigraph? No. If a man will be beaten with brains, he shall wear nothing handsome about him. In brief, since I do pur- uh, propose to marry, I-, I think nothing to any purpose in the world that I can say against it, and therefore never flout me for what I have said against it. Her man is a giddy thing, and this is my conclusion. For thy part, Claudio, I did think uh, to have beaten thee, but in that thou art like thy my kinsman, live unbruised and love my cousin. <laughs> I'd well hoped that thou wouldst have denied Beatrice, that I might have cudgeled thee out of thy single life to make thee a double dealer, which out of question thou wilt be, if my cousin do not look exceedingly narrow to thee. Come, come, we are friends. Let us have a dance ere we are married, and we may lighten our own hearts and our wives' heels. We'll have dance and afterward. First of my words, therefore play music. Prince, thou art sad. Get thee a wife, get thee a wife. There's no staff more revered than one tipped with horn. Uh, <clears throat> my lord, your brother John is taken in flight and brought with <clears throat> armed men back to Messina. Think not on him till tomorrow. I'll devise the brief punishments for him. Strike up, Pipers! The end! Fantastic! Oh my god, this was great. Y'all are fantastic. Thank you for watching. And, um, yeah, have a great night. That was so much 